And we're going to talk about insects first, because in fact, we'll be talking in special topic number two about insect pheromones. Also, special topic number three, pesticides, deals mainly, of course, with the control of insects. So make sure you picked up your slide syllabus. You can do it afterwards if you want. So we're going to talk about bugs. They're everywhere, of course. We OK about recording? I think I pushed the button. Great. Lots of insects, of course, around the world. They outnumber us, as you can see, uh, 3 million to 1. But thank God, bugs, for the most part, are tiny. If ants were the size of cats, we would be their slaves, for sure. <laughs> and you can see, they're, they're everywhere. Spiders are not insects, per se, but we're going to talk a little bit about spiders. Beetles, of course. And you can read about this. I, I had to delete a bunch of the slides to have this fit in one hour. Uh, if you take Kim 63 in the summer, we'll have the full complement of bugs. They cause a lot of disease, of course, crop losses, as you can read about. The text slides here are in the syllabus or on Canvas. And of course, lots of diseases. Malaria is number one, caused by mosquitoes, still a major problem. So let's look at some of these bugs. Cockroaches have, have been around millions of years. We know that for a fact. They're everywhere, very difficult to eradicate. They don't carry disease, but they eat your food, and they're major pests. But they also make good pets, as you can see. Flies carry lots of diseases. We have flies in this building, or at least in Burke, every year. They, they just come out of nowhere, it seems. Common house fly. The tsetse fly carries sleeping sickness, as you may know, in Africa. The pheromones, here, here are some of the pheromones. In fact, there's one active, optically active compound, one isomer produced by the female tsetse fly to attract the male. We have chiral centers here. So in fact, somehow the insect or bacteria in the insect is able to synthesize one of the possible four stereoisomers. This is why your, your mother is always vacuuming the rug, the carpet. Dust mites. Dust causes asthma, the proteins in, in bugs, and also in various uh, foods and, and cats, in fact, also trigger asthma. Bed bugs have been in the news a lot recently. And in fact, depending on where you live, this is the, the ranking of the problem with bed bugs, mainly in big cities and hotels. And here's what they look like a close up. These are mites. They're just amazing insects when you, when you get really close, as you can see. This is the guy that, that uh, causes lice. Head loss, major problem in World War II in parts of Italy, for example. And fleas. As you know, fleas carry bubonic plague, the Black Death. That is still a problem in parts of the world. It wiped out a third of Europe in the 13th, 14th century. It still can be a problem in parts of the world. This is a mite that kills honeybees. It's a little tiny mite that will get on the back of a honeybee and eventually kill it, one of the <laughs> There's several reasons why honeybees are becoming distinct, or, or extinct, rather. And you, if you look closely here, you can see these mites, these little red things right there. And this guy actually took this course some time ago, Chem 52. He's now an entomologist at Cornell. He's been studying honeybees for a long time, looking at the various problems, not just mites, but pesticides and some other causes. Lyme disease, a major problem. It started in Connecticut, Lyme, Connecticut, and is now, of course, up in most of the east. In New Hampshire, if you go hiking, you want to be careful to check yourself and check your pets if you take a dog hiking with you that carries Lyme disease. Here's the world's largest tick found in Ethiopia before it's engorged on your blood. No, I'm only kidding about that part. No, it's, it's, it's big enough. Give me a break. 
Mosquitoes, of course, carry lots of disease. And when, when she gets her blood meal, the female, not the male, in so doing, she's now transferring, for example, the, mar the malaria parasite. And if she's infecting an animal that already has malaria, she can acquire the malaria parasite. And you can see, she's like a syringe. New mosquito, this is now implicated in uh, Zika. In fact, it's been in the news a lot, of course. Mosquitoes have been around a very long time. This is a mosquito that was killed, actually entombed in a drop of amber 46 million years ago, long before humans were on Earth. And they know it's filled with blood because you can find hemoglobin by x-ray. Here's a tick, likewise entombed in amber, a drop of a tree resin. And if you look closely here, you can actually see the bacterium. It causes Lyme disease going back 15 million years. Here's a guy, and if you look closely, you can see a mosquito up here. And the mosquito is taking blood. You can see a little more blood, and now it's full. And so this guy has been infected, perhaps, with malaria or with the other diseases carried by mosquitoes. I was in Oregon as a graduate student and did a lot of hiking, climbing in central Oregon. Mosquitoes are huge there. If you live in Oregon, they're in, around the Cascades. Very large mosquitoes. Grasshoppers are not a major problem, but in fact, grasshoppers can transform into locusts. And when they do that, they become aggressive and they go on population explosions, devastate parts of the world, including this country. And you can actually do this in the laboratory. You can change a grasshopper, a little shy, solitary grasshopper, into this locust with serotonin, the compound we mentioned before. You can do this in the laboratory. And you could just tickle it. If you don't have serotonin, just give it a rub on the leg, and you'll, in fact, induce this change. And then they go on an explosion. Parts of northern Africa, depending on the rainfall in the spring, if you have heavy rain, all of the eggs that were laid the, the preceding fall will hatch, and you have these population explosions. And you can read about this in the Bible. Have any questions? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. If you have any questions, just yell out, because I have to look up there. So what in nature triggers this change from uh, grasshopper to locust? You'd have to look it up. I'm not sure. But it, it's, it's a chemical or physical change. But maybe it's in the Bible. <laughs> it could be in the Bible. Yeah. I think it's sense. <laughs> yeah. And again, here's a typical swarm of locusts. You can see. About every 10 years, there's a major outbreak in, in parts of Africa. <laughs> This guy didn't make it, you can see. This, this really felt good, I mean, let me tell you. Locusts also have mice. If you look closely here, you can see mites, in fact, on the locust. And here's the typical plague, 1988. Again, lots of rain in the spring. All the eggs hatched, and they had this enormous swarm the size of West Virginia, a giant cloud. It blots out the sun, and people starve to death because they eat everything, the locusts, nothing left. In a night, when it gets cold in the desert, of course, it gets below freezing, the locusts will gather into a giant ball. And the, the outer layers, like an onion, will freeze and die, but the inner core of the locust <laughs> stays alive, the sun comes up, and they go on their march again, or their swarm. This country also had a locust swarm in 1875, uh, a huge, if you just imagine the size, the number of the locusts, a giant black cloud of death of vegetation. This is roughly the size of California, and I think actually about the size of California, a swarm of locusts. And again, people starved to death. But then they disappeared. We have no reason why they actually disappeared about 1900, became extinct. Yeah. What was the last word you said? Buzzards. Are they the same thing as locusts? No. Buzzards? Yeah. I haven't heard that term. Well, buzzard's a big bird, though, right? Yeah, that's what I 
Oh yeah, no, no, they're not that big. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Now the good thing is that lots of these insects, including flies, locusts, crickets, are a good source of food, of protein. They're low in fat, low in carbs, rich in protein. And you can compare this, again, this is in the syllabus, you can compare the amounts to beef and milk, in fact. And lots of species are now consumed worldwide, as you can see, by many countries. And here's an example, grasshoppers, red ant eggs, very, very good source of protein and other things, and some energy as well, and crickets. And in fact, if, if you're in Thailand, watching a soccer game with your beer, you often have a giant water bug rather than a potato chip. They're, they're crunchy, just like a potato chip. But you can see these are actually a favorite snack in Thailand. And here, some chapalonis, or chapalinis. Okay, now we have a lot of pests to crops, of course. We'll talk about caterpillars separately. A cotton boll weevil was a major problem in this country when cotton was an important commodity. And here he is. They're kind of cute, but you don't want to be fooled. These are nasty pests. Okay, let's talk about ants. Now, most ants are, are not harmful to people. There are three species, though, that are potentially dangerous. Hard to read. These are the bulldog ants in Tasmania. They're very aggressive. They've been known to attack people. If you get too close to their nest, they will actually jump on you or, or try to jump on you. Called the jack jumper, in fact. <coughs> then we have Mexican army ants, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later. Huge populations in a typical nest, more than a million individual ants. And again, if they were larger, we would be in trouble. And then we have uh, Siafu, these ants in East Africa. Very vicious, and in fact, farmers welcome them because if they're planting crops, the ants don't touch the crops, they'll eat the rodents and the birds and the lizards that would otherwise eat the crops. And in fact, in this, parts, this part of Africa, they used to, used to execute uh, criminals using these ants. I think I have that on a separate slide. Yeah, this is a great show if, if you're into ants and other sorted bugs, good show. Ants have been around a long time. I just got this last week. Again, two ants fighting years ago, a long time ago, 100 million years ago, fighting, and a drop of amber from a tree fell on them, and they become, became entombed, as you can see, locked in death. Leafcutter ants, if you go to Belize or uh, uh, maybe Guatemala, Mexico, you can actually, on the trail, you can in, encounter these walking leaves. And if you look close, each leaf is carried by a little tiny ant, the leafcutter ant. And they're used to build their nests and also to harvest uh, food on the ants. Again, these guys are tiny, but just thank goodness they're not larger. <laughs> yeah, that's the jack jumper. Here is again a jack jumper ant waiting beneath the flower, waiting for a bee to come along. Sorry. Yeah, he actually catches the bee. Just unbelievable. And of course, they do clean up the environment. When an animal dies, ants will consume what's left. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, probably on land, I, I would guess, yeah. I would guess on land in that case. Fire ants, a major problem in this country. They were brought to this country a long time ago, uh, settling, as you'll see, in Alabama. Major problem in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. I don't know if anybody is from that part of the, of the country. And they're very fast, very tiny, and their venom is extremely painful. I was scuba diving in Curacao some years ago, walking back from the beach, stepped on an ant nest in bare feet. And I had to drop all my stuff. I got them off. It was OK. But the pain is amazing. That's why they're called fire ants. It's like a little tiny sharp needle. Now, this guy, who I think might still be alive at Harvard, an entomologist sp specialized in ants, he had the opportunity in 1942 to alert authorities 
to this new ant species that came to Mobile, Alabama from Argentina, but didn't say anything. And in fact, they're now spread, as you can see, not just in parts of this country, but in other parts of the world from this country, in fact, as you can see here. Very difficult to eradicate. And they just have enormous super colonies, millions of ants, and not just one queen. They might have multiple queens in, in one giant underground nest. Really like, just like robots, little tiny toxic robots. And here is his, his quote that he published some years ago. He was a Boy Scout, he was 15 or so, and he, he noticed these ants. He was the first and didn't say anything. And here's a typical nest in, in Texas, or, and these mounds, and it's basically one giant colony of ants. This is the fire venom, a simple piperdine. It's called a piperdine. We'll talk about this in chapter 23, secondary amine. This is the poison hemlock. This is produced by the hemlock tree. This is what killed Socrates. He was forced to drink a, a potion made from the poison hemlock. And you can see the relationship. And again, here's a fire ant stinging a volunteer. You can see the inflammation and the pain right away. Yeah. <coughs> It probably does to some extent, yeah. Uh, the way it's biosynthesized, probably from a long chain fatty acid that already has a built in long chain. The alkaloid in the plant has a shorter chain, but they're both very toxic. I'm just wondering with the shorter chain make it more toxic. Not sure, I'm not sure. The longer chain might make it more, more soluble in, in tissue and fat, I think. But I'm really not sure about the toxicity of this in terms of LD50. We know that this is lethal if the dose is enough. And here's Socrates again drinking. Here's what the tree looks like. There's a new ant discovered not too long ago, as you can see, 2014. And this ant has the ability to invade a fire ant nest with impunity because it has a venom that detoxifies in an acid-base reaction will detoxify the fire ant venom. Uses formic acid, the simplest carboxylic acid. It makes the salt no longer toxic. Here's another ant that uses a five-membered ring. It's called a pyrrolidine. Again, we'll talk about these in chapter 23. And it acts as a tear gas. This ant can go into another nest, release this compound, and then steal the baby eggs or the babies. Mexican army ants on the march, again featured on this TV show, and talked about by H.G. Uh, Wells in one of his short stories, Invasion of the Ants. Here's the queen. She can lay 3,000 eggs a day. And if you figure out that's so many eggs a minute or so, I mean, it's unbelievable, 24 hours a day. She's fed constantly, and then these are the eggs. And she's in the middle of that, of that horde of ants. Here are the soldiers, they, they guard the, the nest, of course, guard the queen. A lot of these are blind, but this guy doesn't need eyes with you know, these mandibles. He just has to kind of feel his uh, prey. And they love to invade yellow jacket nests. Here are the ants invading the yellow jacket nests where they would steal the larvae. And here's Willie Wasp coming out. Here's all this racket on the outside. What's the heck's going on here? This is when I left, believe me, I didn't want to be part of that. OK, do you have any questions about part one? I have to put this on separate PowerPoints. Sorry? Hang on, just say it. OK, one more time, sorry. The queen ant. They're, yeah, well, they're, they're raised by other ants, probably not the soldier ants, can't see. But one of those will be the queen. So many of those will be more soldiers, more workers as well, I think. Yes, I, I would say so. 
But again, the fire ants now in Texas and in the South have multiple queens, multiple colonies that live together, apparently. And then uh, when treating the fire ant colonies, do you use, like, can you spray formic acid on them? Probably, yeah. That, that, might, that might, might be a way. But that reaction is reversible, of course. You're not really destroying the venom, just protonating it. But that reaction, as you guys all know, is reversible, acid-base reaction. Conventional pesticides, as I had on one slide, I think, don't work. The ants will simply move to a different field. And it's, they just don't work, actually. In Chem 63, we do talk about some pesticides that have worked to some extent. Here's the ant we saw earlier, the exploding suicide ant. Here's, here's the poison sac. New ants are being discovered all the time. This is in... Uh, <coughs> in uh, Mexico, in, uh, near the Yucatan, in particular, where these ants have been discovered. Yellow jackets, bees, wasps, hornets, also a problem in this part of the country. You have, we have a lot of yellow jackets. I'm a winemaker, and when I start making wine with grapes in the fall, yellow jackets appear out of nowhere, it seems, because they, they love the sugar, obviously. Okay, we're going to meet the beetles now. These guys do a lot of damage, especially out west, as you'll see. There are many, many species of beetles. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands. But there are some beetles that cause damage to trees out west. The ponderosa pine, the beautiful tree out west in California, Montana, Oregon, Washington, killed by this little tiny bark beetle. And now the trees are very susceptible to forest fires. As you can see, they're basically dead, even though they're standing up. And here's what these guys look like. And you can see this is the aftermath of a, of a forest fire. Damage that was done not that long ago. You can see along the Sierras, the Cascades, and the Rocky Mountains as well. Here's Mount Adams in eastern now Washington, one of my favorite mountains. Beautiful mountain, about 12,000 feet and has had two major fires in last August and August uh, 2015. And the result, it's because of the bark beetle killing the trees. And then lightning will start these fires typically and very difficult to control. In fact, here's a tree named after this, this beetle, a different beetle obviously, that died recently because of damage from an insect. And you may have seen this if you live in LA. Dutch elm disease, big problem in this, in this city, in, in this, this town, in fact, on this campus, because years ago we had beautiful elm trees around the green. I'll show you that in just a minute. But in fact, this little beetle can basically starve the tree and kill the elm tree. Here's a shot taken in April 1942, and you can look. Here's at Dartmouth Hall, of course, all these beautiful elm trees. This is before leafing out, I guess. Taken by, remember, class of 42. And these trees are all gone now because of that beetle. Some beetles are good, some are bad. Ladybug is considered to be a good beetle, a good bug, and because it eats aphids, that would destroy vegetation. Japanese beetles, a plague in my vineyard in Norwich for a long time, uh, are major pests. We had to cover, because we had bird problems as well, so bird nets. But I devised a, a beetle trap I'll show you later on. And every, every different crop has its own beetle as you can see. Even dung, yeah, amazing. And here, here is a beetle feeding on a dead toad, kind of hard to see. And on the beetle also are mites, you can't quite see, that, that feed on maggots that are also feeding on the toad. <laughs> it's, nature can be amazing, I guess. And here's a fungus beetle. And if you live in San Francisco, as I did, we, had, we were plagued by these guys, just awful beetle called earwigs. Why are they called earwigs? Sorry? Why are they called earwigs? I don't know. I'm not sure. 
Uh, and I was always afraid of these pinchers as a little kid. They were getting in the house, awful things. They're called earwigs, I'm not sure. The stink bug is kind of a big problem, especially down in Virginia, I know, and that, that parts of the uh, east, east coast, releasing compounds that I don't think have been identified yet. They're kind of a musty smell. And again, they were brought in from Asia. So when that happens, you have no natural predators. Wasps don't recognize these guys as a food source, so they multiply. And that's what happened with the gypsy moth and with the Japanese beetle and lots of others. And here's another beetle, just an amazing, this is one of the biggest insects ever. And he actually looks like this thing. It's, it's, un it's unbelievable. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Crazy. And, and this guy too, just, oh, nature can be amazing. Again, they're pretty tiny, but just imagine if he were your size. This is the world's heaviest insect, the uh, Goliath beetle. Again, they make very good pets. They're vegetarians, basically. Well, I can't say that, I guess. I don't think they are, but they do make good pets. They don't bite you, for example. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, in fact, in, in Japan, for 100 yen, you can buy a pet stag beetle. And here's, here's a boy taking his beetle on a walk with a leash so he doesn't run away, as you can see. They have their own pets too, I guess. Okay, caterpillars uh, do a lot of damage, of course, even more than beetles. Caterpillars are what eat the crops. And it's, they, of course, become butterflies and become moths, but it's the caterpillar stage that does the damage. The gypsy moth that we'll talk a little bit more about, and the corn earworm, you can see all these guys eating crops of various types. Again, they're kind of cute, but they should be squashed at every opportunity before they eat. Uh, no, I know, I hate to say that. I, I, but look what these guys do. Well, look what this one guy did. Talking to his mother, I think. Okay, the gypsy moth is really interesting. Again, it was, it was brought here from France by a professor of biology who wanted to start a new silk industry. He wanted to mate the gypsy moth with the silkworm moth. Lived in Medford, Massachusetts. And a few escaped. He put the egg masses on his windowsill and they blew off and then multiplied in Medford and then throughout New England. But started in Medford, Mass. And we know exactly the house where it was. And if you live in Medford, you probably know where this is. Now this, this was his house right here on Myrtle Street. You know, right off 93, I think is here, 20. And then they multiplied, spread around New England. And now they're, of course, on the West Coast as well. Now, with all moths, it's, it's the female that secretes the pheromone. In this case, it's an epoxide. I think I have that next. It's an epoxide. We'll talk about in chapter 18, in fact. Detected by the male, and you can tell the difference. The male has well-developed antennae. And, and in fact, the, the male, at least the gypsy moth, is able to detect as few as 10,000 molecules. That may sound like a lot, but in a single drop of water, you have 10 to the 20th molecules of H2O. 10,000 is nothing. So it's amazing. And he's a very good flyer, very sleek. As you can see, the female is loaded down with 400 eggs. So she can't fly, so he has to find her. And the record apparently is about a mile and a half where a male was able to find the female based on the scent. Depends on wind conditions, of course, and everything, but was able to find the female. How is that study run? I'm not sure. You'd have to look it up. I've got references. And here the females laying eggs on Cape Cod. The male gypsy moth is the caterpillar, of course, that does. What's that? No, no, he didn't. No, he was jailed, I think. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> and so, again, the male, the, uh, yeah, this is now the male, it could be the female as well, uh, does all the eating, the caterpillar stage. 
This is a forest on Cape Cod. Complete defoliation. It's not so bad now, although last year I think that they had a major outbreak of gypsy moth infestation in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. It tends to fluctuate, and it's amazing how, how much these guys grow. Now here, here are some caterpillars, tiny babies, one, one day old, little tiny cute things, and then three days old, five days, and after nine days they go from this to this of munching. Unbelievable. So they can do a lot of damage to your crops. Okay, termites are now the third class of uh, social insects after ants and, and bees. We have termites. Cause a lot of damage in this country, not so much up here, it's so cold, but in California, in the south, termites do a lot of damage simply by eating two by fours, by eating wood, and your house will fall down eventually. Again, here is the female loaded with eggs. Obviously, you can see her, her head right here, but here's her abdomen filled with eggs, and she has to be, be nurtured by all the workers. And my theory is they have to move her to prevent bed sores. <laughs> I mean, she's, I mean, that makes sense, I think, right? That, and the, the king termite remains mated, married to, the, fem, to the, the queen for life, basically. It can be as long as 10 years. But again, yeah, here's, here's the king, a little bit bigger than the workers. And again, thousands of eggs are laid uh, daily, really. Here's some more mounds in Africa. I was at a conference in Jamaica some years ago, and I, well, I noticed this thing on the tree, so I, I just touched it, and my finger went right in. It was just like paper, and all these termites went pouring out. What the heck is this? So, so that was amazing, yeah. Okay, there are lots of ways to control insects, of course, not using pesticides. N nature can do this to some extent, but you know, how many gypsy moth caterpillars can they kill? How many fire ants can they kill? But in fact, the fire ants do a pretty good job of at least one caterpillar in this case. And again, here's a guy waiting, I think you saw this, waiting for the bird. Yeah, you did see that. And here's a guy, he, he, he looks kind of nerdy, but this is, he's called the assassin bug, the assassin bug. He's an amazing insect, bulgy eyes, of course, but killing again a caterpillar. One trick that flies use, and bees also, they will lay eggs on the back of, in this case, a caterpillar. They, they don't feel it, but then the eggs will bore into the caterpillar and then eat the caterpillar from the inside out. And, you know, this guy has no chance. Uh, here's another case where the wasp will kill a grasshopper, put a single egg here, the egg eventually will actually become a new wasp, will actually go into the into the, uh, the grasshopper and become, as you can see, a new wasp. Here's another guy that, uh, called the aphid lion. And what he does, after he kills an insect, he'll actually wear the carcass, the husk on the back, apparently to attract a, a mate, to attract a female mate. And then the robber fly, which used to be a big problem. I used to take my kids to the main coast and on the beach, and the robber flies would come, large biting flies. Here's a ladybug laying eggs on the outside. And the trouble with using hard pesticides is that the hard pesticide, whatever it may be, we'll talk about those later, will kill these guys, but not the pest, which is inside the cocoon. So it will, will kill the ladybug. And here's some, a newer pest in, in uh, Florida. Okay, do right, you have any questions about that? <clears throat> okay, let's see. Okay. Any, Spiders do a great job, but again, how, how, many, how many bugs can they eat in a day? This guy, the wolf spider, doesn't use a web. He simply pounces on his, uh, his prey. As you can see, a fly here. And here's kind of a grasshopper thing. 
Gary Larson, great cartoonist. He's not so popular anymore, not, not so uh, prolific anymore, but one of my favorite cartoons is this one. <laughs> At the end of a slide. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Webs are pretty strong, but not that strong. The Black Widow, you've all heard about it. Really a, a beautiful insect, or beautiful spiders, you can see with the, the hourglass. Mates with the male, he'll, the female will eat the male after mating, in fact. And then the babies come out. This guy is one guy you really got to watch out for, brown recluse. Very shy spider, hence the name. Found, I think, in this part of the country, certainly in the southwest. Uh, very dangerous. No antidote for the venom, for the bite. And here's a guy, after three days, he was bitten by one of these guys, right on the thumb, right there, I think. And they, they couldn't do anything about it. It just gets worse. I know you guys haven't had lunch yet, so I'm going to skip very quickly the last slide. So he, I'm sure he lost his thumb, at least. So. Not that I know of. Chop off the thumb. I, I think if, if that's all correct, and I, I think it is. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Right, right. That's right. That's right. Okay, plants actually do a pretty good job of bug control. This is the famous Venus flytrap that Charles D uh, Darwin talked about. And they really do work. And they have little, little tiny hairs inside. You could, years ago, buy these at Hanover Hardware on Main Street, where Lou's, next to Lou's maybe, used to be there. And if you touch these hairs, and you could do this with a toothpick, it really does work. If you touch these hairs, it closes up instantly. And here's an ant wandering around, or I, I guess a spider maybe. Here's an ant wandering around, looking for food. And he goes in, and this is what happens. And then the plant secretes enzymes, the protease enzymes, that will literally dissolve the ant and use the protein and the nitrogen for food. So, yeah. <laughs> Here's another thing, the pitcher plant. And again, you may have heard about these. There is a, uh, a garden off of 89 down near... Um, I forget the name of the town off 89, Newport, New Hampshire, where you can actually see these. But they're pretty common around the world. And again, they're, they're designed so you have hairs that are point downward. So if a bug starts to go in, he has no choice. He has to keep going down. And at the bottom of the plant is a pool of liquid enzyme that will dissolve the bug. So here's a guy wondering, yeah, what the heck's down here? And you can see eventually he's down here, and no way to get out. And that's shown here. Here's a, a spider. You see how the hair is? So he can't go back up. He has to go with the grain, if you will, and eventually be dissolved. This is another guy, the sundew. This is a, sort of like the Venus flytrap in a sense, but this just looks like a field of morning dew on the plant, which you have if you go hiking in the morning. Of course, you have dew. But it's not dew, it's glue. And what happens is if an insect gets stuck on, <coughs> on that, as this guy is, as you can see, when the plant gets hungry, simply closes on the bug and will dissolve the bug. <coughs> Just some more examples of that. <coughs> Beautiful plants, yeah. Frogs do a pretty good job, but you know, how many roaches can they eat in a day? A gecko, if, if you've been to Honolulu, for example, geckos are welcome in the condos in the apartments because they'll eat the cockroaches, which are abundant in Hawaii. And my brother actually 
had a pet iguana. He would always win the pet contest. And so finally he was banned from all these amateur pet contests. He would always win for his iguana, <laughs> which of course, actually is a vegetarian. And they're pretty common in the Caribbean. I know. <laughs> but again, every predator has its own predator all the way up the food chain. Maybe the great white shark is the exception. Uh, poor little guy. <laughs> oh, I hate this one. Gecko is so cute. <laughs> uh, bats do a very good job. And in, in the summertime, if you walk at night around the green, you see bats flying around, apparently erratically, but they're actually snatching up, snaring numerous insects, especially mosquitoes. And they do a great job. Kind of cute, but again, they can carry rabies. That's what you have to worry about. <laughs> this amazing archer fish is blowing drops of water to knock this Japanese beetle into the water. Well, where he'll, uh, he'll eat it. He or she will eat it. And in larger insects, you've got a 30 30, 30 on six. And we're, I'm not sure what that is. Now, the praying mantis, beautiful insect but can be very vicious. Here, the praying mantis has actually captured a hummingbird and is able to hold onto it, and I'm not sure how it's gonna eat it, but uh, he actually caught it. Yeah, they do have fun here playing king of the pencil. <laughs> okay, now I wanna get to the insect pheromone part, and this, this is kind of the most important part for you guys, not just all the bugs. A pheromone then is defined as a chemical substance secreted by an organism that will influence the behavior of other members of the same species. And again, this is on canvas and also in the red syllabus. An alimone, which we'll talk about at the end, is a little bit different. Again, this is secreted by an animal organism that will influence behavior of a, a different species that is favorable to, to the secretor, skunk secretion, for example. And caramone is a little bit different. We're not going to talk about these, but this, in fact, is a chemical secreted that is detrimental to the secretor. And one example are ant trail pheromones. They're ant eaters in parts of New Zealand, Australia, that have identified the scent of the ant. And they can follow the trail back to the nest, back to the hive, and clean up ant eaters. Okay, we have three types of pheromones. Alarm pheromones used mainly by the social insects, termites, bees, and ants, sorry. And they're basically released in various concentrations to alert other members of the nest that you have this attack going. And in fact, we've identified certain compounds that depend on the concentration. If it's a major attack, a large anteater, you have one secretion. If it's just another ant that's lost, a different kind of secretion, in fact, that may not belong to the nest then. Trail pheromones obviously are used, again, by the social insects mainly to locate food. And if you ever have ants in your kitchen, in, in your, your parents' house, for example, um, the way to get rid of them is just to remove the food source. And you'll actually see the trail disappear as the ants are not rewarded when they don't find food. They don't reinforce the trail it slowly evaporates. And so these two types of compounds are very volatile. If they didn't evaporate quickly, you'd have trails everywhere, alarm, pheromones going off all the time. So they have to be volatile compounds. And by that, I mean simple alkanes, alkenes, but mainly ketones and aldehydes, very volatile compounds. I'll show some examples of those as well. And then sex pheromones obviously have to be more complicated. They, they, they're also volatile, of course, but you, you can't, they have to be very different, obviously. You can't have the praying mantis have the same sex pheromone as a ladybug. It'd be a disaster, obviously. <laughs> Normally secreted by the female, not always. Again, some can be very complicated. The cotton boll weevil uses four different compounds in a particular proportion, and it has to be the exact proportion, I think i show you that later, uh, to, and it actually secreted in that case by the male, I think, um, 
some are used to attract and some are used to excite for mating it can be very complicated okay how do you get these compounds out well fortunately it's easy not by me but by others to gather together to collect a large number of insects and that was done in these cases and then you put these and this really gets messy put these in a wearing blender with solvent and this was done to extract everything obviously then you have to separate and bioassay the compounds to identify the sex pheromone and you can see only very small amounts were identified because each individual insect has just a tiny tiny amount so you need a lot of insects to get still a small amount of compound but fortunately as natural products go these compounds are fairly simple in terms of chemical structure relatively easy to identify using mass spectrometry and NMR I'll show you one example in a bit the other way which avoids all the feelers and the eyes and everything else is to actually excise the sex organ and extract it from that and that's been used in these cases but again it takes a very large number of insects just imagine 300,000 moths you have to have to excise and extract and they got five milligrams again it's it's not easy but but the actual compounds are relatively simple the more humane way is never kill the insect just put them in a cage the males or the females depending and just pass air over the cage while you're feeding them of course pass air and collect the air in a cold trap and this is called milking so as they uh, exude the pheromone it's trapped in a cold trap and can be identified and this has been used in these cases as you can see okay again the gypsy moth uh, as I mentioned can t detect uh, the, the male 10,000 molecules single drop of water you have a very large number of molecules are really really small again you saw this slide before and here is the male moth again well-developed antennae I have one of these in my office if you want to take a look you can tell the difference between the male and the female the antennae very well developed lots of receptors capable of identifying detecting only a few thousand molecules which is amazing and then they get together, of course, and do their thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Okay, this is how you isolate the pheromone. At least one example from the female housefly. You get a bunch of flies, and you give them a nice warm bath in hexane. Now, it, it's warm, but it, it does kill them, of course. And then you do chromatography of the type that you've done a couple of these and then you get out a pure compound and it turns out you have to do a bioassay that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute and it was a simple compound one degree of unsaturation if you remember from last term how to calculate that so it reacts with bromine to give a dye bromo compound it's hydrogenated you can see to take up one mole of h2 you can ozonize it again last term chemistry I think chapter seven or eight cleaves carbon carbon double bonds to give two aldehydes so then you know right away that muscalure the housefly sex pheromone is that compound NMR tells you the stereochemistry of, about the double bond very very simple compound and we synthesized actually a couple pounds of this years ago in a lab right above this room for use on flypaper to make a flypaper more effective and we sold it I think to shell or something I'm not sure ever what happened after that but lots of times um, the synthesis of these compounds is fairly simple now you have to do a bioassay because when you do these experiments you're getting all kinds of compounds out even with a housefly you do the chromatography as you guys know you get a bunch of different compounds how do you know which one is the pheromone you do a bioassay Here's a, a male gypsy moth, well developed antennae, held up to the exit port of a gas chromatograph. Just, just held there, he can't fly away. And when the active compound comes out, you know you see his reaction. And that identifies instantly the compound. Now, now what you do, of course, we're all scientists basically, you don't rely just on one moth, that you get a whole bunch. And then when they all react, you know that's the active compound. 
that you collect and then identify as the epoxide that we'll talk about next week. Okay, the reason people do this as <clears throat> they do this as uh, alternatives to hard pesticides. You could imagine building, let's say, a big pit, putting a sex pheromone in the bottom of the pit, and that would attract all the male moths. And if you designed the pit so they couldn't get away, that would be a way to control these. And that's been used, not with a pit per se, but with a trap. You can design a one-way trap. Here's a trap that I used in my vineyard to try to catch Japanese beetles. A very simple trap. This is yellow. Beetles are attracted to the color yellow, Japanese beetles at least. Then you have a funnel. The pheromone, the synthetic pheromone, is down inside the funnel about here. So beetles, they're not very good flyers, but once they hit the, uh, the baffle, they'll drop down into the jar and can never get out again. So we would fill a jar up in an afternoon and then, then change the jar. The trouble was, as it turned out, I was using too much pheromone. I was attracting beetles from New York, I think, <laughs> and I lived in Norwich. Very, very effective. The confusion method is what's been used mainly around the world. It's easy to synthesize these compounds relative to the synthesis of chlorophyll or cholesterol, something like that. So you make a lot of the compound, and it doesn't take much to get, them, to get the insects confused, spread it around. And so the males are looking for their food, or maybe a sex pheromone as well, die of exhaustion because the pheromone is everywhere and they can't be satisfied, they can't find food, food or a mate. And this has been used, as you'll see on the next slide. Or you can have poison food where you have maybe a trap, the pheromone in a trap, and then a hard pesticide in the trap. And that way you don't have to spread the pesticide around. And that's been used a lot as well. Here's some real examples. As you can see, I'm not sure where that was. Cotton fields confusion method's been used in California, San Joaquin Valley. You can see it's much more effective than just pesticide. New York, the Finger Lakes, where there are lots of vineyards. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of these pesticides in the next special topic. And again, it's been used around the world as well. The trouble with traps, in order to eradicate, let's say, the male gypsy moth or the female, you'd have to catch all the males. If you catch 99% of the males, the remaining 1% can still fertilize, obviously, the females. So traps normally are used in this country to identify potential problems with infestation. And Here's in Pennsylvania, these are now male gypsy moths caught in the trap. Okay, here are some of the compounds. You don't have to know any of these. I just wanna sh show you the types of compounds. Uh, here is an interesting compound, the millipede alamo. We'll talk about this in chapter 19 or so. It's a cyanohydrin, an allene functional group, which is two contiguous carbon-carbon double bonds. It's chiral because it is twisted, phenol. This is used by this beetle as a sex pheromone, just our simple hydroxybenzene. A nitroalkene, very rare compound, as you can see, another allene. Cotton boll weevil, four compounds. It have to be just in that proportion to be attractive to the female. And some other compounds, you can see lots of chiral centers, only one of which is active, because again, receptors in you, in your nose, and in the nose of these bugs is chiral, made up of proteins. Proteins, as you know, have, have chiral centers, except for glycine. They're optically active, and so only one isomer will react with a receptor. And here's another compound, again, a four-membered ring. Cyclobutanes in nature, fairly rare, but there are examples. And again, the stink bug uses one of these compounds but in order to identify it, you have to synthesize all four and then compare with a natural compound. This is amazing. This one in particular, this is the female gypsy moth pheromone. The female nun moth, a totally different insect, which coexists with the gypsy moth, uses the enantiomer. And there's no crossbreeding, which is astounding because the, you know, the difference is just the mirror image again, indicating that receptors in you and me 
and in these bugs are chiral. They only accept particular isomers. Now, there are some exceptions to that. If you look closely here, this is a little complicated maybe, but all of these are long chain acetates. And some of these are identical, in fact. But these bugs have evolved in different parts of the world. There are only, only so many compounds that can be synthesized. And in fact, in some cases, they are the same. But the two classes of insects, in this case moths, have evolved in different parts of the world. So there's no chance for crossover. This slide amazes me. Here's the Japanese beetle pheromone. This is called a lactone. We'll talk about this in a chapter or two. It's a cyclic ester, beautifully smelling compounds. I mean, esters and lactones, they're quite common in what we eat and drink. The black-tailed deer uses almost the same compound. The only difference is the double bond's in a different place, and the chain is a little bit shorter or longer. The rove beetle uses this compound, and this compound is found in oak, oak wood, in fact. All very similar compounds. OK, the last part of this, we're going to talk about alimones. And this is how insects have evolved to protect themselves against attack, at least by another insect, not so much by you. And so again, this is the definition. Millipedes, if you touch a millipede, they can be common. They're, we're common in, in California, at least. It'll curl up into a ball and exude a liquid. And this liquid is an imine, novel compound. We'll talk about imines probably later next week. Uh, that is a potent tear gas, as it turns out. And here's some ants, nice, not, uh, nicely feeding on a drop of sugar water right here, having a good time, bothering no one. And here is a melting point capillary with a tiny drop of that imine. And you can see the result after one and a half seconds, ants are being repelled, not being killed, but just repelled, a true tear gas. And you can see the result after two and a half seconds, the ants are gone. Another millipede secreting secretion. The bombardier beetle, I've mentioned a bunch of times, it's an amazing insect that has two, two organs, two glands, one of which is the hydroquinone, actually this compound in one gland and the other gland has hydrogen peroxide and when you pinch that beetle these are mixed and you get oxidation of this that we, we in fact talked about on Wednesday to benzoquinone this compound and again that's the metabolite of benzene that reacts with your DNA to induce leukemia if you have high concentrations of benzene Sorry? It can aim. Yeah, in fact, you see that on this slide. It's called the whip scorpion, which is related. It has you now a turret that can revolve and aim depending on which leg you bite. You pinch this leg, the spray's coming this way. Pinch this leg, the spray's going right here, and so on. It's amazing. It's called the whip scorpion. And this guy uses a slightly different spray acetic acid and a longer chain acid that normally are okay they're not going to hurt you but if they're hot concentrated this will burn you if you're a bug at least or a bird here's a bird getting knocked over as it turns out by a spray and here's another spray you can see the drops of liquid here coming out and the blister beetle. Millipedes actually produce hydrogen cyanide, this molecule we talked about day one, HCN. And the wolf spider taking a, or getting exposed to this millipede, you can see his expression. Uh, it's <laughs> maybe hard to see. Come again? No, no, I don't think so. These eyes here? No, I don't think so. What are they? I think they're just eyes, real eyes. <laughs> and here's a bird taking a bite of this monarch butterfly, and you can see gagging on the result. 
my favorite sequence. Here's an ant attacking a bombardier beetle from the backside. <laughs> Big mistake. You never, never do that. About to take a bite, and you can see the result. And he'll never do that again if he survives. <laughs> and this guy as well. Now here's the bombardier beetle. About to take a bite, he's getting sprayed, and you can see the result. Yeah. And a toad and a millipede. Now this guy has the right idea. You eat the bombardier beetle head first, and the rear end is back here. So the, the SN1 mechanism. <laughs> Never the SN2 mechanism on a bombardier beetle. <laughs>